Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Paluga. I am the product specialist for the particle sizing instruments here at Fritsch Milling and Sizing. Today I would like to give you a little presentation about particle sizing in mining and why it can be really beneficial for you. In order to get started, let's have a look at the tasks that you are facing in the mining industry. The main issue is that you have to separate the ores, which is the product of your interest, from all the other materials that are present. Usually this is done by grinding. So the goal is to separate your material into very fine particles so that each particle consists of only one material. Now, in this practice, of course, the particle size of the final product highly influences the efficiency of gaining your final metal or whatever material it is that you are looking to get. And this efficiency, of course, has a major influence on the cost of this entire process. A second thing that this can be important for is once a mine is finished, so the so-called backfill, when you have to get some kind of material, soil or earth, and refill the open uh, holes that you mined in order to um, guarantee public safety. And of course, this backfill material also needs to fulfill certain criteria regarding the particle size in order to be stable. So in both cases, we are talking about quality control. And this quality control is done basically by monitoring the size distribution of your material. Let's talk about size. So as you can see by the header here, the size is relative. And I will just show you that if we talk about the diameter of a particle, which is what we always look at when we talk about a size distribution and how a small difference in a particle's diameter can have a very huge influence on the efficiency of your process. Why is that? As an example, we see here a particle with a diameter of 10 micrometers. And now we look at a second particle with a diameter of 20 micrometers. So as you can see, the diameter is only doubled. It's only a factor of two. But what is important, of course, when you want to separate your materials and you have single particles consisting of only one material is not the diameter, but it's the volume. So to know the exact amount of your material. And the volume, of course, goes with the power of three. So in this case, with a 10 micrometer particle, our volume would be, of course, um, we are assuming here a spherical particle, would be 524 cubic micrometers. If we look at that for the 20 micrometer particle, our volume would become 4200 cubic micrometers. So as you can see, the volume grows by eight times when we increase the particle size just two times. And at the end of the day, the volume is the deciding factor. So you see a small difference in the size distribution talking about the diameter can make a huge difference talking about your process. And if we have a look at an even, big, even bigger difference, in this case, we have a factor of two. Let's take a factor of three. So let's have a look at a 30 micrometer particle. This would mean that our volume would increase 27 times. 
as you can already see, uh, this goes on and on. So um, the difference in the volume is really, really huge compared to the difference in diameter. And that is what makes the huge difference in your process in the end, at the end of the day. But the main issue, of course, is how do we measure such small particles? We've been talking here about micrometers. As a comparison, a human hair has a diameter of 50 micrometers. How do you measure that? With a caliper? I don't think so. So, at this point, of course, Fritsch comes into play as we deliver all the solutions you need in order to find out the sizes of such small particles. So let me take this opportunity to give you a quick introduction to our company. Here you can see the location of Fritsch in Germany in the southwest and the city of Ida oberstein There you see an aerial view of the city. It's not a big city. It has about 35,000 citizens and has come to fame in the 19th and early 20th century due to minerals and agates uh, crystals which have been found in the mines here around the city. Of course, quite early in the 20th century, the mines were empty and the businessman had to go elsewhere to find new minerals. But basically until today, the city is the German center for gems and minerals. Out of this also the company Fritsch arose about a hundred years ago. It started with building mortar grinders for pharmacies. These mortar grinders were of course manual, but they were made out of agate. And here you see an aerial view of the company as it is today. Well, not exactly. In May 2022, we actually opened a new building right here on the upper side of this long building. So we should update this maybe in the future. But me myself, I'm sitting somewhere down here. This is the sales and lab building while we have also a quite new building from 2014 up the hill, which is the manufacturing. And to this day, hopefully also very long into the future, we are still manufacturing all our products here in Germany um, in these facilities up here, which is something that we are very proud of. Here you can see a small overview of our product line. As you can see in the company name, it's called milling and sizing. Our main products are the mills, which are used for sample preparation, which are used for comminution, um, grinding materials down to smaller particle sizes. And out of this application, just naturally, uh, the two instruments on the right side developed because at some point we needed to, of course, prove that we can grind down to certain sizes. And there we do have two options, which is the laser diffraction on the top and also the dynamic image analysis on the bottom. In this presentation, we will focus only on the laser diffraction and our NLZ-22, as that is the technique which is mostly used in the mining industry in order to determine the particle size. How do we measure the particle size of such small particles? As I already mentioned, um, when we talk about these small, small sizes, uh, a direct measurement is not really possible. So what we do is we perform an indirect measurement. We measure a physical property of our sample and then we calculate our particle diameter from this property. So of course we need an appropriate theory to do so. The theories which are used here are already 100 or 200 years old. There are actually two theories that can be used, Fraunhofer theory and Mie theory. But 
predominantly in mining as uh, me theory really comes into play in the submicron range. So in mining, we should be fine using the Fraunhofer theory mostly. And what we of course also need is a little bit of an understanding how this indirect measurement works. So it is called laser diffraction. And that always gives us a hint at the physical process which we use to determine the particle size. It is light diffraction on our particles. So as you can see here, we have a particle and from one side we have a laser source which emits laser light onto the direction of the particle and on the other side we have a detector array. Of course, without any particle in between, what we would get on our detector is just in the middle here one single peak from our laser beam and that is it. On the left and right side of the peak we should have more or less darkness, so uh, no signals. But as soon as we bring, and of course here we see only one particle, in reality we uh, show many particles, we bring many particles into the beam, and what happens is the laser light gets diffracted on the different particles and what we will see on our detector array is that we will not only have this main peak from our main laser beam but we will see other peaks as well in certain distances across our detector array and what we use here is the relation that the bigger the particles are, the smaller the scattering angles become. So the closer these different peaks come together and the smaller our particles are, the bigger the scattering angles become and the bigger the distances between the different peaks. And that is the way that our software can then calculate the particle size distribution from the light intensity distribution. And that's how a laser diffraction instrument works. Of course, uh, in reality, this is not one dimensional, but you will see uh, rings. So as you see here, small particles, we have widely spaced rings, the distances are big. And once we measure large particles, we'll become narrow rings, the dist distances become small. Of course, in reality, we use a detector array only here in one line, so we only measure the distance one dimensionally. So, in order to use static light scattering for particle size measurement, we need an appropriate setup. So, let's now take a look at the hardware. And in principle, it is rather simple because what we need is a laser on one side and the aforementioned detector element on the other side. And then we need a measurement cell um, where we can process or circulate our sample material through the glasses so that the laser beam can go through our sample material and the light can get diffracted on the single particles and this way we get our pattern on our detector array. So in theory it's of course rather simple but in, in reality um, the optical setup becomes a little bit more complicated and a little bit more sophisticated in order to improve our signals and in order to improve our results. And for these optical setups, of course, different versions and different ways are possible, so everybody does it a little bit differently. The thing that matters is that the calculation in the end fits to the setup. Uh, here you see a short overview of the different versions of the NLZ-22. The first one is the orange one on the upper left, which was introduced in 1985. So we were actually one of the first companies that built 
uh, an instrument for static light scattering as the first one was built in 1984 and the main reason for this is that lasers and the theories were already available in the 1950s what was not available until um, the mid 1980s was the computer power a computer that has enough brain power to calculate um, our particle size distribution by just having the light intensity distribution. So as you can see, it's an algorithm that is really, really complex. And it was, yeah, in 1984 that the computers had enough power to actually do this calculation in a matter of seconds. So um, you see also the evolution here. The instrument got, yeah, more beautiful and also smaller and the current version which you see here is the NLZ22 Next and um, it's really nice looking it has become really small and we've taken a huge leap forward with this instrument which we introduced in 2020. And of course we have used all of our experience from the previous 35 years and put it into this machine. So let's have a look at the internal setup. It's very similar to what we just saw uh, as a schematic drawing. So we do have the laser inside on one side. We have our main detector array. We do have the measuring cell, which is inserted at a certain angle, so not at 90 degrees. And then we have a monitor here, which measures the reflection from the main laser beam in order to always monitor our laser and that it's functioning properly. What you see here is the setup of the basic version. We do have two versions of the NLZ22 Next. This would be the Next Micro and the measuring range is 0.5 to 1500 microns, which actually for mining should be sufficient in most cases. If you need a bigger measuring range, you can switch to the Next Nano. The main difference is that with the Next Nano, we have five additional large angle detector elements and four backscattering detector elements. Of course, the main detector, which consists of 51 elements, is the same as in the Next Micro. But this way, we reach a measuring range from 10 nanometers to 3.8 millimeters, which is really huge. And there's no comparable technique on the market which can give you such a wide range of measuring particle size. Of course, this is all nice and um, talking about theoretical um, measuring ranges and how it works uh, on paper. At the end of the day, the very, very important thing when we perform particle size measurements and a thing that is often neglected is the preparation of your sample. And the laser or the detector elements and also the algorithm can only give you the results of what you show it. And what I mean by that, I can show you in a short example. So as you can see here, we have a sample which consists of many small particles, but due to any kind of force, be it humidity or be it electrostatic forces or whatever it is, these particles are sticking together, forming one bigger particle, so-called agglomerate. So if I introduce this kind of particle into my dispersion unit and measure it, uh, what I will get is, of course, the size of this huge agglomerate. Um, the result will probably not be what I expect it to be. It will be bigger and I could be wondering why the machine is not giving me a good result. Well, the reason is because I'm not feeding it a well-prepared sample. And 
what we need to do in these this kind of cases is we need to introduce some external power in order to deagglomerate this. So in case of wet measurement, this would be ultrasonic power, which we use to disperse our sample properly. So to break the agglomerates apart. And once that is done, you see now we have all the single particles here. And if we feed this through our measuring cell, then we will also get the size distribution of our single particles and not of our agglomerates. So this is one of the main things to have an eye on when you do particle size measurements to properly prepare your sample. And as you can see, when we talk about analysis errors, and there is no measurement, there is no analysis in this world which works 100% perfect, you will always face certain errors. But if we have a look at the total error, which basically consists of the measurement error and the preparation error, you can already see that one part of this entire thing is something that you can influence yourself, and that is the preparation. So, of course, you have no influence on the measurement error. This is basically our task to build a good instrument and to keep the measurement error as small as possible. But for you as a user, you have to, of course, keep the preparation error as small as possible by, for example, using a good dispersion process, as I just showed you in the previous slide. So this is something to really keep in mind and to be always aware of that you need to focus on the sample preparation and that the machine can only give you a result of what you show it. And so if you show it a well-prepared sample, it will give you a good result. If you show it a badly prepared sample, you will get not such a good result. And to show you how big this influence can be, we have here the error of different sources as a, or depending on the particle size. And if we have a look at this, and let's start maybe with the dispersion itself. So the bigger the particle sizes, the less the dispersion influences our error. Of course, the, the smaller the particle size becomes, the dispersion itself uh, becomes really, really critical. Um, the instrument error, well, becomes bigger with the uh, really big sizes, but also with the really small ones, while the sampling um, is more an issue with bigger sizes and for small particle sizes, sampling itself does not really have such a big in in influence on our measurement or analysis error. But as you can see, of course, um, there are two things you can influence, the sampling and the dispersion. And if you can eliminate those two, you can see that the overall error can be kept really, really small. So in the case of laser diffraction, you need to know what you are doing. And then you'll get really good results in almost no time because the technique itself is really, really quick. Talking about dispersion, we of course need a dispersion unit. So this is basically the unit where you enter your sample into the system. And this is something that we really, really focused on during the development of this machine. Because I showed you um, in the last couple of minutes how important dispersion actually is for our results and for our um, quality control. So here you see a schematic drawing of, yes, basically um, all dispersion units that are out there in the market. And this is also how our old dispersion unit looked like. So what we have is a water bath um, where we can enter our sample. Uh, the, the dispersion is 
fed by a centrifugal pump, uh, which basically pumps our dispersion through the hoses into the measuring cell, through the measuring cell, and then back into the water bath. So during the measurement, we want to have a closed cycle for the measurement. But once the measurement is done, we of course want to drain our sample material out of the system, which is always done by a four to way wa valve. So it is turning, then we can feed fresh water in and we can drain the old sample or the old dispersion out. And once that is done and we want to get ready for the next measurement, this 40 way valve is turning back. The big disadvantage of such a valve is that it is quite expensive and of course it's very prone to damage. As you can imagine, uh, it, this need to, needs to be sealed very well uh, as we always have small particles in there and if it gets damaged the replacement is also quite expensive. So what we did with our new dispersion unit is we want, went a completely different way and it's a very very clever design. So if you look at it schematically it looks like this. Same water bath, same pump. Pump feeds our dispersion through our measuring cell. But then there is no more valve. Instead we have something that we call the reflux which is a metal rod here attached to a motor. So the dispersion goes directly from the silicon hoses into the metal rod back into the dispersion for the closed cycle. And if we want to drain the system now, all that happens is that this reflux moves up into the drain, gets our dispersion out of the system, fresh water comes in here, and once the cleaning process is finished, we just move the reflux back down. So there is no more four to wave off, which not only makes this dispersion unit much cheaper than a regular one, but also more durable and less prone to damage and less maintainable. Or actually leads to less maintenance uh, that needs to be done. So as you can see, this is quite a nice innovation, which not only makes a, a, a measuring fast and simple, but also cost saving. And in addition to this, now you'll see it, how it looks in, in real life on this, this short uh, animation. So there you see the reflux rod moving up and down in our wet dispersion. You see the, the drain there now. Uh, you can also move it during the measurement in order to kind of get a stirring effect um, in your dispersion. And now it moves up into the drain. You see that would be the draining process. And in addition to that, we can also measure the temperature during the measurements so that we make sure that we always measure under the same conditions. And depending, of course, on the material that you are dealing with, it could be also important to monitor the pH value. So with our instrument, you have the opportunity to buy a certain pH meter from Metla Toledo and you can mount it onto the dispersion unit, connect it to the computer and the software will be able to also read the pH value during your measurements, which is something that is also quite unique. Talking about dispersion, we of course need to talk about the amount of sample that needs to be added as well. Because this is a very common question by customers who have not been in touch with laser diffraction yet. How much sample do I need? And the first thing I have to say is that the amount of sample of course depends on the size of your particles. So the smaller your particles, the less sample you'll need. The bigger the particles, the more sample you need. The simple reason is that it more or less depends on the number of particles because each particle, let's say, will scatter one ray of light. So we need always the same amount of ray, light rays that are scattered. 
and if the particles are bigger, same amount of particles of course means bigger volume, and if they are smaller, the same amount of particles means smaller volume. But there is one other thing that we need to look at, and that is the so-called beam obscuration. What is the beam obscuration? Beam obscuration is the amount of the original laser light which is taken away by our dispersion, by our particles, or which is diffracted by our particles. So if you compare the detected main laser beam without sample and to the laser beam which still reaches the detector when the sample is entered, uh, we want to have about 10 to 25 percent of our original laser light to be scattered by particles. And the reason for this is that we don't want to go too high because what we will get is multiple scattering. So one beam will get scattered by one particle, continue through our dispersion, get scattered by another particle and give us basically a false signal. But we also don't want it to be too low because in that case what we will have is a very poor signal to noise ratio which will make it quite difficult for our software and the algorithm to calculate a, a proper particle size distribution. So also here we need to compromise a little between these two extremes. But of course uh, using the instrument for quite some time and I can say that from my own experience you will get quite a good feel for the amount of sample that needs to be added for a measurement within uh, a couple of weeks. Some other nice features of this dispersion unit is that talking about concentration of sample we can adapt the volume. So let's say uh, you only have a very small amount and you have problems reaching a proper concentration. No worries, you just decrease the volume in the wet dispersion unit. You can set this in the software automatically and then you can make measurements with less volume. So you need to add less sample. And talking about the agglomeration, we can just add the ultrasonic box. Maybe your sample does not agglomerate. Then you might not need the ultrasonic box, which we see here on the right side, the silver box. Um, but if they do, you can buy it separately. This means that you don't have to spend the money if you don't need it, but if maybe at a later point or from the beginning you do need ultrasonic, you can add the box to your purchase, which makes the whole thing much more flexible. Now let's come to the real life measurements and I want to show you some examples um, how results look like and how they look like for different materials. So uh, what we see here is some battery material, uh, lithium cobalt uh, in the middle, the red one. Um, this is three, no actually I think it's five consecutive measurements and we see that uh, our particle size distribution is somewhere here around five to six micrometers and I also added some measurements of the same material but with different particle sizes. You can see here uh, one carbon powder where the particle size is more around three micrometers and another carbon powder where the particle size is more around maybe 15 micrometers. Um, both calculated or all three were in this case calculated with the Fraunhofer theory. Uh, you see also some other important information talking about the dispersion. In this case the measurements were performed in water, uh, a 0.1 percent solution of sodium pyrophosphate was added. Um, this basically decreases the surface tension of the water and thus helps our sample to better disperse with in our water bath. Also you can see some duzazine was added which is basically also a surfactant and has a similar effect as the sodium pyrophosphate. 
again, you see the preparation and the dispersion is the deciding factor here. And the main thing which you see is that in each case, we performed multiple measurements. So we want to ha have information about the dis stability of our dispersion. In each case here, we see that the consecutive measurements are more or less identical. So there is no shift in a certain direction uh, which would indicate that our dispersion is not stable, that something with our particle size is still changing, but we see that it is stable and thus that we can rely on these results. And each of these samples were probably measured uh, with three to five consecutive measurements within maybe one and a half or two minutes and then you have the result. So you can see it's really, really quick. Uh, maybe another example is some molybdene, which is also a, a mining product. And you see on the right side the chart. Um, this was, as we can see in the information, measured with ultrasonic treatment. The particle size is around 2 microns. And of course, you don't have to, like I did previously on the previous slide, take it from the chart. But you can, of course, in the software, um, customize the table, either a percentage chart where you can directly read the D10, the D50 and the D90, which are the most common. So in our case here, you see the D50 is 1.66 micrometers, while the D10 is 0.46 micrometers. And you can just the same way customize a size distribution table which in this case shows us here that uh, looking at one micrometer, we have 30.5% of our sample material is smaller than one micrometer. And uh, going on, you see 75% uh, is smaller than three micrometers and 99.8, so almost everything is below 10 micrometers. So that way you have uh, really, really quick uh, idea of uh, does your sample material fit your quality control criteria or not. And as I mentioned, these measurements are performed within one to two minutes. Let us summarize. So our NZ22 Next has a uh, maximum measuring range of 10 nanometers to 3.8 millimeters, while you also have the option to uh, downgrade to the basic version, which will, of course, save you money. Uh, the, the design is really compact. So the width, um, we haven't talked about it, you haven't seen any reference here, but it's about 70 centimeters. The depth on the table, if you also um, attach the ultrasonic box is around 65 centimeters. So it is very, very compact and basically should fit any laboratory bench. We saw the flexible configuration. Not only can you choose between two versions for the measuring unit, but you can also choose to purchase the ultrasonic box or if you don't need it, you can save that money, spend it elsewhere. And of course, since we are doing this for 35 years, we have a state of the art laser and measuring technology. And I can tell you from my own experience, we have to emphasize the first word here, robust. I have been on the road with this instrument, even in Africa, and I was myself really, really surprised about how robust it actually is. If we think about what a high technology is inside there, um, especially regarding our detector arrays. Uh, it's quite incredible that wherever you take it, you just take it out of the car, you put it on the bench and it's working perfectly fine. Of course, fast and reliable as always. Uh, one of the main arguments I think is that we really have an attractive price performance ratio if you compare it to some other manufacturers, especially if you keep in mind that this whole machine is manufactured, still manufactured 
here on site in Germany by our own engineers. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this information was helpful for you. And of course, you can contact either us or your corresponding distributor in your country via phone or email anytime. Thanks again. See you next time.